Good morning. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In a preaching course that I took year before last, we were told that whatever the scripture that is assigned for a particular Sunday, one must read the whole chapter or Mark's gospel from which this week's reading come is like a mountain. As we go up one side, we hear about the ministry of Jesus, the miracles, the healings, the feeding of the thousands, the calling of disciples. At the top of the mountain is Peter's declaration, you are the Christ. Now this is stated exactly who Jesus is. Today, we come down the other side of the mountain. Now, before Peter's declaration, you are the Christ, there must have been a lot of speculation Jesus was among ordinary people, among the Jewish leaders, and certainly among the Roman authorities. When Jesus told the disciples that he would be rejected, abused, and even murdered, Peter rebuked Jesus. In his own humanness, Peter could not imagine such a thing happening to a Messiah. Peter was not considering God's purpose, but only his own, but his only natural desire and feelings. Peter wanted Jesus to be king, not a suffering servant, as prophesied in Isaiah 53. He was ready to receive the glory of following the Messiah, but not the persecution. Peter saw only part of the picture. Now we know Christian life is not a paved road to wealth and ease. It often involves hard work, deprivation, suffering, but great joy. Some of you may be familiar with the board game, the game of life uh, is now called just life. The game simulates a person's travel through life from college to retirement, jobs, marriage, and possible children along the way. Through the decisions made by the players from choosing a career to risking money in the stock market to having the opportunity to give to a good cause, the game attempts to model the ups and downs of life. With one spin of the spinner, you can lose everything or double your worth. Unfortunately, our society tells us that winners are people with status and clout. Winners are people with healthy, normal, whatever that is, families. Winners are people with money, with no problems. We want others to look at us and see people who have it all together. We do not want anyone to think we are losers. We want to end up in millionaire's estate with all the other winners, not at the countryside acres with others, other losers. The scripture today turns this concept of winning and losing totally upside down. In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus begins talking about the idea that are not what others are expecting. He's very plain, there's no parables. He tells us that, teaches us about the suffering that he must endure. He tells his followers that he will be rejected by the temple leaders. 
that he will be killed, that he will suffer, die, and on the third day be raised from the dead. But all of this is just too much for Peter. Peter had just proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah, the chosen one who will redeem the people of Israel. But this Jesus isn't talking like the Messiah that Peter is expecting. Peter is expecting what many of the Israelites were expecting, a savior who will come with great military to throw the Romans. And all this talk of suffering and dying and rejection is not at all what Peter thinks Israel needs. In his mind, Israel needs a winner at the game of life. They need someone who can stand up to the opposition and then put them in their place. He wants the Messiah to have power and wealth, death on a cross. So he pulls Jesus aside to talk some sense into him. Peter rebukes Jesus. He begins to tell Jesus everything that is wrong. He tries to convince Jesus that what people need is a winner who triumphs over the inner over the enemy, not a loser who is rejected and put to death. But Jesus turns to him and his words must have, get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine how Peter must have felt? Here he right thing by talking sense into his master and his master turns and calls him Satan. Jesus then goes on to say, you do not have in mind the things of God. But Jesus has to continue his teaching to his disciples. And and his healing ministry gradually opened the eyes of the blind man at Blaseda. So he gradually revealed to his disciples the nature and implications of his messiahship. He would lead. They must be prepared to deny themselves, to abandon any thought of self-centeredness, they must be prepared to take up their cross to perhaps face martyrdom. Now, as we know, in those days, it was a common practice on the Romans for the person to literally carry the cross beam to their place of execution. Not a pretty thought to contemplate. Simply put, a God's will to accept loss and injury in the cause of Christ and his gospel, and all the while refusing to spend all our energies on preserving and enriching one's own life in this world. To follow Christ's example is to become more like him. Now, some of you may be familiar with uh, John Grazon's book about the character, the series uh, about Joshua. In Joshua and the City, the main character, Joshua, is a model of Jesus. He sets out to confront the many needs and injustices that face a large city, a city that could be anyone in the United States today. He takes on a huge project of urban renewal without the body of bureaucratic red tape. And he overcomes seemingly insurmountable problems like poverty, racism. As he lives among the people, as he walks their streets and eats in their homes, lives are touched, relationships are healed. Hearts are transformed. Despair is, 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 despair is, there's hope that is given. 
as the people accept the challenge that Joshua lays before them, they begin to change within themselves. And the process with his love and support, they become more and more like the one who teaches them. They become more like Joshua. Of course, fiction is one thing, and certainly we know from the story of the journey that changes do not come easily or as quickly as we can turn the pages in a book. We find out as we read Mark that even the disciples in their humanity had some difficulty in following Jesus to the cross. Some fell asleep and Jesus went to pray. Peter openly denied Jesus after his arrest and some went into hiding until after the resurrection. But ultimately they were changed. They went out and preached everywhere during the work that they had been commissioned to do. It was only after Jesus' death and resurrection that the disciples understood why he had to die. We're now in the second Sunday in Lent. Let us remind ourselves that Jesus' message was not only for his disciples and followers then, but continues to be a message for all those who would follow him. Simply not a retelling of what happened at that time. It is intended to show people everywhere exactly what is involved and demanded whenever and wherever they recognize the Jesus is the Messiah. But what we also need to keep in mind, the thing that makes it doable is that we are not alone in this. We have that we will fears. There's nothing that Jesus has not seen that he has not heard, nothing that will cause him to withdraw his love or his grace. Consider Abraham. Each time that God called Abraham's name, he answered, yes, Lord, here I am. The promise that God gave Abraham stated that Abraham would be the father of many nations, that the entire world would be blessed through him. Now, although Abraham's life was marked by mistakes, sin, as well as wisdom and goodness, he consistently trusted God. His faith was strengthened by the obstacles he faced, and his life is an example of faith in action. Even when God was asking Abraham to sacrifice his own son, his trust in God never wavered. At the last minute, his son was spared and another sacrifice was provided. Abraham knew God as it revealed to him. Abraham looked to God, he obeyed God, and he waited for God to fulfill his word. Thankfully, not all of us are called upon to face the life and death situations that confronted Abraham. But we all do have to make choices all the time. Some big, some very small choice that reflects on our own discipleship, that each and all together give a telling picture of our commitment to Jesus. None of us can know what lies before us or what will be asked of us in the days and even years ahead. What Jesus asks of each of us is that we follow him through our days, that we keep our eyes on the one who endured everything for us, that whenever, wherever life's path takes us, we let his love and light guide us. Let us try during this Lent to be the disciple Christ calls us to be, 
disciples who truly follow Jesus to the cross, then truly nothing in this life can touch us. Thanks be to God. Amen.